that conduces to the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. That is what a constitution must be. And having set the objective of the constitution, you then frame a constitution to achieve that objective. Because we really do have a race problem. Those divisions are real. We see it in our politics. We see it in our trade union. We see that they take the divisions with them. Look at where people live in this U.S. You have enclaves in, in the Bronx and, and in Richmond Hill and in, and, and in Brooklyn. They're taking the division with them. Women are dying in the streets and we have a government pontificator running around campaigning for women's vote. No women should vote in this election coming up unless there is something done to the legislation as Magistrate Kim is advocating. That voices like ours that are not in the political trench fighting it out, voices like ours should um, become stronger. One of the things about the Caribbean is that we have never had one discourse Bass will know the days of the new world and the old world and the radical left and, 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 and so on. What we had was this concourse of ideas, which I think in the early days of independence pushed up, pushed us in, in a certain direction. We've got to move back to that point of having these multiple discourses. Good night. Good night to our viewers. Good night to everyone out there, to all of Guyana, our Guyanese brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Welcome to this Globe Span program. And just before we get into our program, let me pause for a minute to give credit to our Globe Span 24 7 team, to Mr. Nohar Singh, to Kumar, Devin, and all the people working so hard behind the scenes to make tonight's program and all other programs a success. To our viewers out there and to our business community, if you would like, if you like this or other Globespan programs, please feel free to join us. You can also advertise with us or sponsor various programs by contacting us, sales at globespan247.com. Brothers and sisters, viewers, the political landscape of Guyana morphs with each passing day, with fresh new faces and ideas coming up to challenge status quo. There are a number of new parties that have indicated their interest to contest the next general elections, which is no easy task to achieve given the requirements that must be met to so compete. The daily dose of political verbiage will obviously change with new parties on the scene. Yet, we have already seen the types of promises being made by almost all of them. From the ridiculous to the obvious, promises will, as I promise you tonight, will continuously be made with no real studies and no real feasibilities being undergone to have them transform from promise to reality. Nevertheless, the truth is that one of the most refreshing things about having newer parties is their zeal to move the pendulum away from race. And if anything, they can take this country forward. And if anything that can take this country forward, it is our ability to reconcile beyond race and prejudice. Tonight, we'll be meeting the presidential candidate of one of the new parties, a new and united Guyana. This was among the first party this year to announce itself on the scene. Here with us tonight, is Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, Senior Counsel. Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, Sir, Senior, welcome to this Globespan 24-7 discussion. Thank you very much, Yogi. I'm, I'm a, a, a friend of Globespan and have been fortunate to be invited on several occasions in the past. Wonderful. Uh, sir, you are the presidential candidate of a new and united Guyana. You are at, in your young age of early 70s and extremely well respected in the legal and political field. You are most known for a number of things. One would, for example, be your years as an executive member of the PPP and, of course, your distinguished service in terms of the Speaker of the National Assembly. The public is aware of some disagreements with some of the PPP leadership 
and other developments therefrom. I would like us to divide our discussion tonight in three parts. One is your years under the PPP, two, briefly, your years as speaker, and three, your choice of political platform. Senior, not many of the younger generation may know that your years under the PPP would have started with your dad. Yes. The names and contributions of those of years gone by are buried. Tell us in a couple minutes of the influence your dad had on you and your dad had on the birthing and the development of the PPP itself. Well, he never spoke much to us about politics, but his life experience was very important for us. He was, in his early years, he was not well off. He was a train conductor. He worked at the Transport and Harbor Department much of the time in clerical work, but he better, was better known as a, a, a train conductor on the East Coast. And he was very popular at that time in the late 40s. Uh, he was a founding member of the Transport Workers Union at that time. Uh, at one period, Joseph Polidor was the secretary, he, general secretary. He was an executive member from a very young age. He was in his 20s at the time. And his mentor was a man by the name of Frank Van Sertima. Frank Van Sertima was the father of the academic, uh, the late academic, the US, in the US, uh, Dr. Van, Professor Van Sertima. Mm -hmm. uh, so Frank was uh, the mentor for many of the young people at that time. And it was Frank who encouraged him to join the PAC in 1946 or 47. And from then he stayed in the PPP. So much of the early days, his friends were people from transport and they were mainly black. Most of them, if not all, were black. There were a few Indians, but all, all the friends who survived with him in his older years, his retirement years, were transport workers union, mainly black. And we grew up in a mixed community. Of, there were three sections of the community, Hindus, Muslims, and Africans. And it was a very peaceful community, a warm community where everybody was friendly to each other. So those were the life's lessons that I learned from my father. I remember when he was imprisoned. I remember when he was um, on restriction. He was uh, restricted from Plaisance to, to Kitty in 1953. And then that lasted for, he was in prison in 1954. And after he came out of prison, he went to work and he had to get permission <laughs> to go beyond the um, Lamaha Street in Kitty, Lamaha Street and Vicentian Road. Okay. And uh, he had to be above the, uh, beyond the boundary, for, uh, I think it was by five o'clock. And I remember he used to carry me on his, on his bicycle sometimes. And I remember <clears throat> on one occasion he met someone and he wanted to talk to them. Someone hailed him as they were passing and he called them out to come and meet him. And then he stopped, but he pushed his bicycle over the train line at Lamaha Street, at the junction of Lamaha Street and Vicentian Road. For those who don't know, there was a train line going across there. He came, the train line was the, was the landmark where he couldn't go beyond. So he came over north of the train line and spoke to the person. So all of those little things I remembered. Right. Um, and that gave us a sense of struggle, a sense of uh, the need for to fight for what you want, for the betterment of your country, and that kind of thing. Great. And, and it's refreshing to, uh, I, I, you know, I believe that one of the sad things with Guyana's politics is over the years we have tend to, uh, whether conveniently or not, but we have tend to sharply close the doors <laughs> of history um, on, on those who contributed to, 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 to the real change that Guyana had experienced. Um, senior, throughout the PPP's history, monumental figures have left that party. And pardon me for asking you some of these questions, but one cannot ignore your seniority up to the last day you left, uh, you left that party. Throughout the history, monumental figures have left that party at critical junctures of the party's history. There were names like 
I think Ranji Chandi Singh, Vincent Tika, and a number of others. And then uh, uh, the more recent Ram one. Sorry? Balram Singh Rai. Balram Singh Rai and so forth. And then the more recent one would have been Mr. Ralph Ramkaran. <laughs> the, <laughs> the difference between many of them is that Chandi Singh, Tika, and so forth left and joined the PNC. Yeah. Um, but Ralph Ram Karan left and started to work on building a core that can challenge status quo of both the PNP and PNC. Comment a little bit on, on, on that, uh, you know, the difference between those other monumental figures that left and, and your vision in starting to do this transformation. Well, um, to go backwards a little bit, I mean, it is true that a lot of people have left the PPP. Balram Singh Rai left, I wouldn't say for opportunistic reasons. Balram Singh Rai, Rai had, um, he was an important figure in the PPP. He was, he was um, like yourself, Hindu oriented. He, he was, had strong cultural beliefs, beliefs which nowadays would, would, would not have been unusual in politics. Um, at that time, the PVP had always, even from those days, the PVP always wanted an African deputy because of the ethnic situation and because mm -hmm. Cherry Jagan was an Indian. And Rai attempted to be the chairman of the party and it wasn't, the leadership didn't approve of it. I didn't support him and it became very bitter and he left because of that. I understand up to his later years, he was still very bitter. I wrote a, an article about him, okay. suggesting that he be, um, you know, be given rec national recognition and that there be reconciliation with the people. I understand he made efforts. Balram Singh Rai made efforts, but okay. those efforts okay. were rebuffed. I was unaware of those efforts, but I was oh. told about them later. Um, Chandi Singh left for political reasons. He had political ideological reasons. Uh, and he went with the PVP, he went with the PNC because of that. Vincent Tika left because of um, purely opportunistic reasons, and many other people left because of that during the years when it was difficult to get jobs and when the PNC held office, um, you know, on the basis of rigged elections and so on. I left because um, I didn't leave because of ideological or political reasons. I left for purely personal reasons. Because for some reason or other, the powers that inherited the, the top leadership of the PPP, I was in the leadership, but not in the top leadership. The powers that inherited the top leadership of the PPP wanted silence. Uh, we talked for a long time in the executive committee of the PPP about corruption, but nothing was ever done about it. And then I wrote a very mild article and several people took umbrage and kind of insulted me and so on. And I basically couldn't take it and I left. Okay. But Senior, in, in, in th between those years too, there, there are two other names that I would like to, to quickly touch on. Um, while you would have been at, in the executive committee of the PVP during your time there, uh, Ramjatan was expelled and uh, Nagamotu, I think, I don't know uh, what happened in the latter case, but both of them have virtually now joined um, joined the forces with the PNC. Um, and, and, but uh, during those uh, monumental shifts, you were within the PPP, were you not? And what would have been your thoughts as these two men separated? Uh, I, was, I was within the PPP. I was very friendly with Ramjata and I wasn't close to him. Uh, but I was very friendly to him. We had some clashes and eventually, um, you know, after Sherry Jagan died and, and Jagdeo took over, Johnny Jagan and then Jagdeo, his, his disagreements with the PVP intensified quite substantially. I can't remember the, the exact reason why there was a lot of confusion at the time. I think he was, um, I had caused to be written a letter to him in relation to his attacks on Mrs. Jagan, uh, which he refused to to, to withdraw. And he was expelled because of that. But at the time he was expelled, the situation had become so bad with him that it was really 
unlikely that he would have lasted for much longer. Had he not been expelled, he would have lived. Because his relations with um, his relations with with Barujak Bayo and several other people was 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 not a happy one, and I don't think he had much support in the executive because of that. So it was not that he was a popular figure who was expelled um, because at somebody's women fancy, and that uh, there was a great great um, great convulsion because he was expelled. When he was expelled from the PVP, people felt that he deserved it. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. okay. Moses, Moses was a different case. Um, different case. Moses, it was clear to everybody that Moses had been very disappointed. It is his right to be. Let me say that clearly. He was very disappointed that um, that he was not chosen as the presidential candidate. Moses was very unhappy that Bharat was named as the potential successor within the PPP in 1997. He was unhappy about that, but he accepted it. He was unhappy when Bharat became president. There was a big quarrel about it. Uh, and then he was unhappy when it was clear that Bharat was supporting Donald Ramatar for the presidency. Okay. When, when that became clear, Moses then left. But it was well known by everybody that Moses had been very dissatisfied. And there have been many quarrels in the executive and the leadership with him. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I saw him, I, as a matter of fact, I went with him to see Navin Chandra Paul a, a couple of days, one or two days before he left the PPP. So the two of us drove up, saw Navin, and um, he didn't tell me anything. Well, I don't expect that he would mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. in the circumstances. But we had a friendly conversation on mm -hmm. that occasion. Then he left. We still have friendly conversations, but of course, he's a very high-powered politician now, so he doesn't meet lowly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so. That is so. I can say that firsthand. Um, Sina, during your time there, I mean, and, and give thank you for that little backdrop um, thing. You, you, you would have worked in internal matters and and on the same side of parliament with Nagamoto and Kemraj, and um, obviously you would have worked with Granger in parliamentary subcommittees, and you would have been speaker when I think he was in the house, wasn't he? No, I wasn't speaker okay. when he was in the house, but I, okay. I had an end. I'd known him for a long time. I can't remember how we met, but mm -hmm. uh, we're not friends. I just knew him in passing. But we sat together in the border, um, secure, border and Security Commission, which President Jack Dale and Mr. Hoyt had appointed it. In 2001, part of the agreement which ended all the violence, the post-election violence, was the appointment of a number of committees to report how things can be improved and so on. And Granger and I, David Granger and I were co-chair of the Border and Security Commission. I noticed that Mr. Granger has mentioned that commission several times, uh, but he has not mentioned that I was the co-chair. Okay. <laughs> he only mentioned that he was the chairman. Well, they were, each committee had two chairpersons two co-chairs, and for that committee, I was a co-chair and he was a co-chair, and we produced a report. So I worked with him before, quite a while before he became president, but I, I, I've known him. So, so a human interest question for you. You, you would have known all of these uh, good people um, before they became presidents and prime ministers and various ministers and so forth. Um, and in recent months, you vituperated them for the constitutional breaches, etc. Would you, would you have expected these men to get to the stage where they are? Of, to, to I think uh, I'm not quoting you verbatim, but you yourself said at various fora that uh, it was you know the constitution has been breached to the point of of everybody is at a loss. What next? How low can we go? And um, you know, what are your comments? What, could you have expected, could Ralph of 
five years ago have expected that we would get to today when senior people like Managamutu and Grainzo would, would cause us to be in the kind of problems we have entered into. Yes, and we will get to this stage again because the whichever party is in power, the PVP has less capacity to do it because they don't control the population in the city. They don't have the political support of the people in the city. And it's very easy to cause the people in the city to rise up in protest. And the city is the seat of government mm -hmm. and the seat of business and the seat of administration. So the PVP has, uh, has to be far more careful and cautious in what they do. But basically, the two parties are motivated by the, by the, um, by the desire or, or, the, or the, the, the drive to hold on to political power and political office. Correct. And they do essentially the same thing. Uh, it's not that Granger is a bad man or, or, or anybody or bad people. It's just the political system that creates a culture of, of dominance as a necessity for survival that uh, drives people to do these things. That's a very, very interesting way to put it. <laughs> very interesting way. Uh, tell us, uh, when you were speaker, um, uh, just, just a quick, give us a little snapshot of one, uh, one of the monumental, one of the most telling moments for you as speaker in the National Assembly. And, and by the way, are you, are you doing a book on your years as speaker of the National Assembly? I had hoped to, but uh, when I left, the time went and it, I, I didn't do it. And then it looks a, a bit, um, it probably would be stale by now. But no. I, I, it, was a, it was a tormenting period because the PNC then, PNCR, I think in the 10 years I was speaker, the PNCR boycotted the parliament for about three, four years of that period, maybe four is too long. But for the first 18 months or so, they weren't in the parliament. Then they came back and then they boycotted again. There were lots of walkouts, um, numerous walkouts and that kind of thing. So that part of it wasn't, wasn't too nice. But I, I did some innovations. I tried to make my view of the opposition was, look, they don't have political power. The only power they have is the power to speak. So I allow them to give them as much rain as possible to speak. I made, sh made sure that motions are not rejected. For example, in the past, motions were rejected if there was anything wrong, if they didn't satisfy all the rules. But what we did was to ensure that the person who put up the motion was invited and told that these are the problems with the motion. Do you wish to correct it then? And if the person said yes, we helped them to correct the motion and to put it in order for presentation. That's the first thing. We did that with questions as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We, um, no motion was put aside by the speaker. All motions once qualified, they were tabled, they went on the notice paper, and in 12 days they became ripe for debate. And then they went on the um, order paper for debate. So it was, that was a, never occurred before. Right. So you so created an enabling environment. Enabling environment for the opposition. Okay. They didn't, um, they didn't um, recognize me for it, but <laughs> never did. <laughs> well, that's that's politics. Now, um, senior, I, I would have heard you uh, and, and your colleagues of a new and united party. Let's come to the party itself and your political uh, offspring. Um, they, you would have you would have uh, enumerated a number of things that that spoke to to the beliefs that you and, and the group of you within Anog have for the future of Guyana. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I put it this way, you are pushing a line that seeks to effectively bring the main parties together. Is that yeah. so? Yeah. And, and under a concept of shared governance? 
Um, yes, but uh, what we try to stay away from the terms shared governance and constitutional reform because they have become so, we think they have become overused and people um, sometimes no longer understand what they mean and they can convey a meaning that we don't want. For example, the traditional view of shared governance is that the two parties come together and share the government in the proportion of their votes. But the reason why the PNC, the APNO AFC proposals for shared governance did not succeed is because APNO AFC realized that if this process were to be implemented, the PVP may well get more votes than they do. And therefore, they will be in a minority in a shared governance arrangement. And therefore, they, it didn't work. And it, uh, proportionality, we believe, will not work. That is why we put our proposal as a new governance system of equality. Okay. You okay. mind, you mind uh, uh, explaining a little bit more on what is Anog's vision? If, if you were to get into parliament, what okay. will you do? Our vision is what we are hoping, you know, we would like to win the elections and we hope we will win. But realistically speaking, if we don't, we're hoping at least to get enough seats to have a balance of power. That means that neither party will obtain the majority of votes so that they, whichever wins the plurality will have to rely on us and other small parties, if necessary, to give them to the power, the votes, to govern. Now, in return for that, we're not saying that we will support whichever party holds the plurality. We will support critically. We will support only those things that are in the interest of the Guyanese people. And we will not support things which are not in the interest of the Guyanese people. But one condition of our giving critical support would be that they will proceed on constitutional uh, reform in order to create a new governance system whereby the executive, whatever its size, will have equal numbers from the main political parties. If a small political party has a certain threshold, which we haven't de determined yet, be 20%, 25%, 30%, whatever it is. If it has a certain threshold, then it will be admitted in the executive. So the executive will then have three parties. But the two main parties will have equal numbers. Mm -hmm. And the presidency will circulate once a year with the larger party starting first. So the larger party will probably have more years as president. The president for that year will come from all the parties. So you so you can have within the five year span, Indian, African, woman, youth, Amerindian, everybody will hopefully have an opportunity to serve as executive president for one year. Now in order to block or create or block the up, block the question of gridlock where there's equality. If there is no third party, there is equality. And if there is good luck, well, there, there is a problem. Well, there are many ways of changing, of, of dealing with good luck. You can give the president for the year a casting vote. So, of course, every party will have at one time or another a casting vote. Or you can allow the parliament to decide. Executive will not sit in parliament. And the parliament will be constituted in proportion to the votes of the party. So you can okay. get the reform matter to Parliament to um, resolve a gridlock. So that is basic. And the Parliament, about 50 seats, will be elected on the basis of first past the post. And the other 15 will be the top of seats. So those but, are essentially the structure we propose. But that would require massive uh, constitutional reform. Um, yeah. Yes, it will, but I think it's doable. Uh, but and that time to get constitutional reform might be two to three years itself? Well, it will probably take two years, and then we'll have elections under the new constitution. 
But Senior, the, the, the question I had asked some other groupings, in fact, one, your guy had answered it quite nice. Tim had answered it quite well. Um, but I'm going to put the same question to you. The, 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 the problem that I think people are seeing here with, with what you're putting forward is that there is the PPP, there is the PNC or the coalition. Um, and if they don't want to hear what you are saying, they, they really, there's no incentive for them to ever want to change the basis upon which they operate. What there, can you do to make that happen, to force that to happen? There is no incentive because one, the PVP talks about constitutional reform. Um, Dr. Irfan Ali mentioned constitutional reform during last week. He never said what needs to be changed and what is the PVP's position. Uh, the PNC talked about APNO AFC talked about constitutional reform in 2015. It didn't happen. We're talking about constitutional reform to bring a new governance system into place. Now, what we are proposing might not be accepted by the Guyanese people. What we are proposing might not be accepted by the two political parties. But I think everybody has agreed that something is wrong. Something has to be changed. We agreed in 1999-2000 that something was wrong and had to be changed. But the core of the issue, shared governance at that time, that is what it was called, or winner does not take all, was not agreed to by either political party, either the PPP or the PNC. Desmond Hoyt came on board the year after, uh, or, or later in the year 2001 because there's a strong group in the PNC who are advocating shared governance. So we lost the opportunity in 1999-2000. Now the opportunity is potentially coming around again. And this time we will put it to the two political parties and to the people of Guyana, and we will give them our idea. We will sell our idea as far as we can. If they don't, if the people of Guyana don't accept it, then we will accept whatever comes out of the process in accordance with the wishes of the people. <laughs> and we will live with that. So, so here is another issue that, that uh, a lot of people have out there. In a concept of shared governance or in a concept where there is a rotating, on, until we get to that point where you move away from the, uh, the, the, the proportional representation kind of thing. Um, now, if let us say, hypothetically, um, if let us say that five persons from the PPP are corrupt to their core and five persons from the PNC are corrupt to their core, and you have these 10 persons forming the government in which there is a shared governance in a way, um, God help us all because then it means uh, there is, you know, and one of our one of our viewers have asked a similar question: Where is accountability, and and who is going to be watching them? Because what you have presently, the people of Guyana feel we can do nothing about the corruption. That, so that what will is, happen then? That's a very serious problem, and a lot of people, who some who are now supporting um, a, a new governance system for Guyana in the past, Henry Jeffrey, for example, I can call his name. I'm sure he. I have no objection to that. In years past, he had the same issue with shared governance, that there would be no opposition and these things will go unchecked. But if you look uh, around the place, you will see that if there are strong measures to prevent corruption in politics, which will trickle down to the rest of the population, then you can prevent it. For example, the committee, the um, Integrity Commission, it has no investigative powers. That's one. There are no laws for you to submit your income tax returns or your property assets to anybody to check. The Integrity, the integrity Commission can't check. So when you get um, your assets or your family's assets show some kind of increase, there must be an explanation. There are no laws requiring politicians and public officials not to accept gifts. There is some, some code of conduct, but that's not enough. 
gifts cannot be accepted. So if you're driving a new car somewhere, it's in your name or your relative's name or something like that. These things have to be explained. So there are no statutory provisions. There are no structures. There are no instruments to prevent corruption. And, and that is a very that is a very important paradigm you're talking about there, Sina, because it is true that regardless of what happens at the coming election, Guyana needs to have laws, needs to have rules in place that will help us to curb this 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 beast um, that has become an albatross around our necks, this corruption. Because the truth is that I feel um, that, you know, the, the president does not submit his stuff to the integrity commission. So what? Who can do him anything about it? And, and therein lies... The, the problem, the, you can put whatever balance, whatever checks I asked Anil the same question last week, there are procedures in place for corruption, there are procedures in place for the uh, procurement um, and bodies, but if they choose to ignore it, other than the population saying this set of people are corrupt, what else can we do? Well, exactly. Um, I, I wrote last week about impeachment and talked a little bit about the impeachment in the United States and the possibility if the president does commit some um, uh, high crime and misdemeanor, he can be impeached or bribery. Um, <clears throat> and impeachment takes place. In Guyana, there is a separation of powers in the U.S. The Congress is separate from the administrative the executive and the Congress can be controlled by a party, not of the presidencies, which happens in this case. And therefore, that creates the potential for an impeachment. Of course, the Senate belongs to the Republican. In Guyana, it's totally impossible because in our Westminster system, the, you can't be in the government unless you have a majority in the, exec, in the parliament. And no majority in the parliament is vote, going to vote to impeach its own president. So impeachment is thus a, rec a, 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 a decoration mm -hmm. in our constitution. And therefore, those are the things we need to look at and change uh, and make possible. The, the violation of Article 106 of our constitution and the failure to hold election. In our constitution, the president can be impeached for violating the constitution. It's right. specifically states violating the constitution. But the president has violated this constitution by not fixing a date for election before September the 18th. But nobody can do anything about right. it. Unless those things are made possible, then we will continue to have um, these violations and these things like bribery and corruption and all of these things will continue. So, senior, let's let's uh, let's take a little, a couple seconds break, and then we're gonna come back, and I want to get more into your party and uh, you know the visions we have for a number of key areas, including crime and corruption. So let's let's take a couple seconds break. Devin, over to you. The book launch of Jung Bahadur Singh of Guyana by Dr. Beter Amramrak will be held on Saturday, November twenty third, at five p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. This book dives into the life of Jong Bahadur Singh, a prominent leader and mediator who assisted the sugar workers in their dispute with management. This book would examine the legacy of Jong Bahadur Singh as well as his contentious relationship with Chetty Jagan. Support the book launch on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at 10324 111th Street, Richmond Hill, New York. Again, that's Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. Well, thank you. We are back. Uh, Mr. Amkran will be back in a couple of seconds. But in the meantime, to the viewers out there, please feel free to call in or send us your questions. We have tonight on the hot seat, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, senior counsel, uh, former speaker of parliament and also former executive member of the PPP, now presidential candidate of a new and united Guyana. Um, Mr. Ramkran has been on the political scene and his contribution to the development of political thinking cannot be minimized in any way and cannot be ignored. Now, Senior, welcome back. And I want to talk about crime. Um, I think everybody other than the, the Minister of Public Security 
um, agrees that crime has spiraled almost out of control. Um, do you agree with the public notion, first of all, that crime has reached a high level and it, it is of serious concern? Well, you know, it's very serious. Very, it's a very serious concern. I was at a function yesterday and the function concluded and I left living with my wife uh, to go to my car just across the road. And one of the persons there accompanied me. So, you know, we were talking, said, you know, it's necessary to, to, to be sure because somebody in, with a motorcycle or two men with a mo on a motorcycle can come up, pull a gun, rob you in less than 30 seconds, take your wallet, your cell phone, and disappear. That's how serious it is and how personal it is to people who are interested. So one of the reasons, one of the crime fighting um, mechanisms that exist all over the world is support from the population. If you don't have people who are watching out for you and watching, um, watching their neighbor and watching their community and their society, Crime is going to continue to increase and crime is going to continue to be a big problem. Now, when you have the PPP in government, <laughs> Indians don't cooperate with the police. When you have the PNC in government, Africans don't cooperate with the police. So a political solution to the problems of Guyana will see an enhancement of the capacity of the police to solve crime because the intelligence will increase, the cooperation of the police will increase, cooperation with the police will increase, and more crime will be solved. Now, I'm not saying by any means that that's the only, um, the only, the only element for crime fighting. What we need to have you know, at one time when the PVP was in government, I always used to ask, why is the traffic situation in such chaos? I always, I'm always told that you don't have traffic policemen. Now, how is it suddenly there are traffic policemen who are keeping traffic, doing a good job keeping traffic, doing a not so good job stopping people on the, on the road, collecting papers and so on. We know what else they're collecting, but so the, the police have the capacity or can develop the capacity. We need, we need policemen on cycles. We need policemen on foot, walking in border market and all in the Starbuck market and all of these places. Those are things that are important and are possible uh, once uh, the political system changes and some more resources are devoted to the police. Do, do you think that the, the, the lack of success or greater success of the police uh, is, is a reflection of, of the political situation in the country. You know, everything is, seems to be up in the air. There is so much uncertainty. And so there is no certainty in terms of, of bringing crime down too. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, and, and you notice that, um, I don't know what the statistics are, but Policemen are more and more becoming involved in crime if you follow the newspapers and so on. So that corruption is seeping into the ranks of the people who are supposed to be the people solving crime. And a lot of former policemen are involved in crime as well. So the whole, the whole structure, the whole situation, people need to be inspired. People need to be motivated. People need to... I noticed the leader of the opposition said he will take back money from public servants. I mean, you know, <laughs> the government is going to give 9% pay to public servants and he's going to take it back. I mean, what kind well, of... Well, I, I, think, I think to his credit today, he, he issued a press statement to say that was a fabrication, that he never said it. Oh, but okay. to your, yeah, to your, to your point, um, the... In 2014, 2015, APNO AFC, uh, they, they basically, you know, came on a wave of, of fighting corruption and fighting uh, drugs and fighting all of this crime and, and they, they became the government of Guyana. And, and I think a lot of people are very concerned because they, 
you know, whatever crime and corruption they were thinking that they were fighting, even they themselves have not have had zero success in litigating any of these things or even holding people responsible. What would your party do specifically that will bring crime down and will be strong on this position of crime and, and drugs? Well, we, <clears throat> we will try and mobilize the people themselves to help us to battle crime. That, is, that would be the first step try and mobilize the people of Guyana to help us to battle crime. But, but if you if you had 100 days, okay, you're president, president, Ralph Ramkran, you're sworn in today. Within 100 days, what can you promise me, an ordinary citizen of this country, that you are going to do for crime and corruption of public officials? What hard measures will you put in place? Corruption of public officials, we will, we will bring, we will institute, we will implement legislation. We will get legislation passed to stop the corruption, to create offenses which are can be prosecuted. But, but our please, laws are our sorry, laws are sorry, are sorry let, let, let me interrupt. So, sorry, let me interrupt uh, by reminding you of something. One, if I were to go to Greens and now, if I were to go to President Greens and now, and say, look, they're corrupting in the government. He would ask me, he would tell me some words. That is basically a reflection of Donald Ramatar. Donald Ramatar, every time you said to him, there's corruption, he said, where's the proof? Mm -hmm. Now you can have all the laws in the world, but if you have leaders unwilling to accept that their people are corrupt, then we have a bigger problem. Well, you, if you have, if you have the type of leaders, if you have the type of political, always it always comes back. If you have the same type of political system that you have, you will have political leaders who are protecting their own. You know, somebody is saying, was saying to me the other day, do you know why, they, why this um, local content legislation is not being pushed or the local content laws or the local content policies are not being pushed? Because APNO AFC government has very few people who can take advantage of the local content. So they're not pushing it. Now, right. it is the political system that is creating these things, that's cultivating these, these bad habits. Would you disband SARA and SOKU and, or, or refurb or re, re, uh, rebuild them? <laughs> know. They're so broken that <laughs> I don't think they can be rebuilt. I mean, um, the concept behind these things are good. The concept behind Soku was not, Soku was intended to deal with financial crimes. I wrote about it and in the writing, I was able to do the research and find out all the statements of all the people who were behind the establishment of Soku. And Soku's job was the was the was the to look at fin prosecute financial crimes. It was to be a small unit, but when the government took over, it transformed Soku into a political organization to persecute PPP people or PPP who were perceived to be people who were perceived to be PPP, and you know it, it fell by the wayside. So these two bodies. Are, were have useful functions to perform, but they have to be reformed. But, but you see, Sina, that's my whole point, that therein lies the, the dichotomy that we see, that there are laws, there are institutions that are supposed to be in place to, to bring relief to the taxpayers that their taxpaying hard-earned dollars are being abused, misspent, stolen. Um, so, so would corruption form uh, a, a direct uh, part of your manifesto? Corruption would form a direct part of the manifesto, and 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 it's it's a very important issue, as you are stressing. Mm -hmm. And we hope to be able to limit the corruption by ensuring that uh, that the political directorate passes, implements, and manages the laws and a legal process to, to stop the corruption.
Mm-hmm. And unless people are pro- prosecuted, I mean seriously prosecuted, not the type of prosecution that we have seen, because all the cases are being lost, because they're not bringing cases against people who are seriously corrupt. Right. Now, let me ask you another question. Let's just change hats from the corruption and the, the crime situation. Does, would your party, uh, do you envisage yourself collating with APNO, AFC, PPP, and or other small parties as you get into the election race? We have said time and again that once we get into parliament, we will not coalesce with any of the major political parties to give them a majority, a permanent majority in the National Assembly or to obtain political office for ourselves. We would any kind of guarantee that the public wants, we will give. We have offered to make our core promises justiciable so that if we violate that promise, we can be taken to court. We are contemplating preparing a deed to be filed in the registry, a public document promising that we will not coalesce with either party. You see, the AFC has made it very bad for small parties. Correct. They joined with APNU, and they have failed to contain APNU as they promised to do. They have failed in constitutional reform. They failed in so many things. And um, people don't believe that we will not do the same thing. You know, people say, I'm a PVP man, and I will join the PVP. I will take, but my party has people like Henry Jeffrey, people like Timothy Jonas, people like Jonathan Yearwood, and many other prominent officials. I don't know, I can't take these people along with me to PVP or any other party, depending on. I was not, I did not self appoint myself as the presidential candidate, as some others have done of the smaller parties. You know, I had to go through a process. There was a nomination, there were discussions, then there was a nomination. So, was but, a- your, but your process was not like the other party's process, right? <laughs> no, I was oh. not self-appointed. <laughs> I, was, I was elected with competition. There were other, there were three other persons nominated. And um, let me ask you this also. So, so that we, we are clear on, 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 on your party's uh, um, position with regards to coalition. Uh, we spoke earlier about constitutional reform, and I, I omitted asking you this question that I've asked everybody else. Will your party take a position to remove or reduce presidential immunity? Well, that's an issue. That's a controversial issue. It's an issue that we we um, we have often been talked about. Now, I don't see the need for any presidential immunity above and beyond the immunity that constitutional offices are protected with in the Constitution. The Constitution provides for most, for most constitutional offices that they are not liable for acts of, or omissions conducted during the course of their work and for the purpose of their, of their, of their work. Uh, that's enough. Uh, Seen a stick up in there. The, the president chairs cabinet. Yes, yeah. no? Yeah. But therefore, uh, by, by virtue of what we both said, it means whatever cabinet does under the chairmanship of the president then becomes immune, isn't it? No, no, no. If he, the officer himself, if the officer does any act, he, the officer, is not liable for any act or omission committed by him uh, in the pursuance of his duties. So this is personal to him. Okay, got you. But in the course of his duties, he can't order a person to be wounded or hurt. Correct. Or killed. Or killed. Uh, because that is not in the course of his duties. 
So, senior, the, the, the issue I think we both agree, though, or, or you agree with the position that it needs to be revised, the concept of revised, and That would be my position. We haven't discussed it in our party, but that would be my position, that the president does not need more than other constitutional office holders as provided for in the Constitution, which is he's protected from acts or omissions conducted in the course of his duties. Right. Now, the other thing that I think is 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 missing in the mix is is which is what I'm going to urge all the small parties to think of. And I'm sure you have thought of it and your party would have. There are there are a number of Guyanese uh, in the diaspora. A lot of the viewers who were online present. In fact, one of our viewers, Miss Sukraj, wrote what represents a base thinking across the diaspora. A lot of Guyanese would wish that when their time comes for retirement, they return to Guyana and we can welcome them, but they cannot come with a crime and they cannot come under the current political lack of certainty. Uh, so it brings me to the next point I want to ask you about. The, here is the hard question I have for you, Senior. Your, your party is doing its best to get into government. Question one, how many seats do you need or do you think you need to really make a difference? We need four to six seats to really make a difference, in my view. Great. And question two, if you are, a wise general always prepares for defeat, right? So if you are unsuccessful in this, in this, in this vision you have, to create that thing in Parliament, if you're unsuccessful, what happens to Ralph Ramkran SC? Well, I will continue. The party will continue. If we get no seats or one seat, the party will continue with its work. I don't think anybody who is currently engaged with us has any intention of stepping aside from achieving our core um, core core objectives. They all see this as a long process. So we will all continue our work. Um, I can't go for very much longer, but I will go for as long as I can. Well, that's refreshing to hear because the reason I asked you that question was that, you know, it, it, it marks the difference between political opportunism and really wanting to see Guyana do well. And, and I have a lot of respect for yourself and for Tim and, and others within the, the grouping too, as I do for people of other political parties, because we all want Guyana to do well. Senior, I, I need to ask you some other questions, but before I get to that, I would like us to take, Devin, if you can take another short, quick couple seconds break, and we're gonna come back to wrap up the show, and uh, we'll ask uh, Senior for the last question as we move on. The book launch of Jung Bahadur Singh of Guyana by Dr. Beter M. Ramrak will be held on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tulsi Mandir. This book dives into the life of Jung Bahadur Singh, a prominent leader and mediator who assisted the sugar workers in their dispute with management. This book would examine the legacy of Jung Bahadur Singh as well as his contentious relationship with Chetty Jagan. Support the book launch on Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at 10324 111th Street, Richmond Hill, New York. Again, that's Saturday, November 23rd at 5 p.m. at Tusi Mandir. Senior, here is, here is the last thought that I would like to express to you and ask you for your response. The PPP was sometime long ago uh, under the paradigm where it wanted to make the small man the real man. I don't think that is the case anymore. Um, the PNC2, these two parties were seen to have been grassroots party. Um, and, and it was based on, on, on a thinking that the small man could have been developed, that the small farmer could have had a vision for development. It is also felt that your party is, is more uh, of a Georgian club type of party. It is not, not of the grassroots orientation and not of the grassroots thinking. Your response to that, sir? Well, we would very much like to be both a grassroots party and a party of uh, middle class and, and business community. Uh, but it's very difficult to organize 
and get to the grassroots. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Uh, but we hope that we'll be, we're using whatever means we have at our disposal, radio advertisements, uh, TV advertisements, programs such as these. I was on yesterday with uh, reliable sources in, in, inside reliable sources with Gordon Mosley. Um, so we're doing everything we can to reach. We're going to markets all over the country. We've been to Escobar twice, we've been to Aichuni, we've been to Papuani, we've been to Linden three times, we've been to Barbies two times, we've been to East Coast several times. So we are doing as much as we can. Of course, that type of work <coughs> is not publicized. And the people you meet and talk to are not given, you don't get any publicity for that. But we are working towards that end. We well, have the, the, to one of the reasons I asked you that question is that the, 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 the ideological differences between what you're proposing in terms of constitutional reforms and the more top level change of governance and government structure vis-a-vis -vis what the small man wants, what the, what the poor people need. Uh, one in every three Guyanese is said to be uh, living under poverty. So how do you hope to transcend that, that gap? Well, you know, our main objective or one of our three or four main objectives, immediate objectives, is the elimination of poverty. And poverty is an old figure, but about 30 percent of the population live in poverty and about 30 percent of that of those of that group lives in extreme poverty. And we feel it would be our objective, particularly with the oil funds that are coming soon, that we should attempt to eliminate, remove extreme poverty force and then and then poverty, but not by not only by giveaways, but there is a universal basic income, as my colleague Henry Jeffrey wrote about, that we have subscribed to a United Nations uh, program of a universal basic income that everybody should have, whether they're working or not. So we intend to remove poverty. That's our objective. And we intend to create employment by the deployment of our resources in a more efficient and effective manner and the elimination of corruption. So those are our, our, our Thank objectives. You, let, let me, let me uh, I, I was just going to close, but let me accommodate a question from one of our viewers, Oral Murray, who said, uh, if elected, would you reverse, would you revise the salary of ministers since all think it's a fat cat salary? <laughs> I haven't discussed that with my colleagues, but I would be happy if I were president to restore my salary to what it was before. Okay, and okay. I, I am sure I'd be able to persuade my colleagues, if not to restore, but to substantially reduce their own salaries. Good. Sina, thank you. Uh, we, are, we are out of program time. I thank you for being here tonight. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds for your final closing argument, sir. Well, we're offering the Guyanese people a unique vision, a vision that they have not seen before. And that is that when you vote for us, your party wins. As it is today, if you're PVP, you vote for the PVP, your party could lose. The PNC, APNU AFC can get more votes, and vice versa. You APNU AFC, your party can lose. You vote for us, it's not betraying your own party because our program, our plan is to put both parties in government. So when you vote for us, you can't lose. That's my message to the Guyanese people. Perfect paradox, right? <laughs> Senior, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you on the program. I am going to take this uh, opportunity to say we'll talk again on another similar program because there are a number of other more incis incisive discussions I would want to have. Good luck to you, sir, and to the executives and members of ANUG, and keep the good fight going. Good thank night to all of our viewers. Thank you, Globespan team. Thank you, Nohar Singh, Kumar, Devin, and all the others working hard behind the scenes. It's been a wonderful discussion with Mr. Ralph Ramkran, former speaker and senior counsel, now presidential candidate of a new and united Guyana. Good night, all. Have a wonderful night. Senior, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.